we've done this sort of summit probably, how many, Adrian, probably half a dozen cities yeah. over the last six months. Um, we continue to go out and to draft people who are interested in making reforms and to provide them with the tools they need. And so we hope that you'll take this handbook. Um, it's online as well, so you've got this here. But if there's something specific you're looking for, um, it's here. I just want to do a really quick, because we, we're, we're doing all right time, I just want to do a really quick uh, overview of the handbook. It's going to basically follow what we're doing today. It'll give you some tools about steps for reform, studying your, your process and problem. We're going to talk about that in a second. It talks about some of the concerns and myths, objections to reform. Adrian's going to spend a few minutes on that at the very end. It gives you some tables and graphs to work with to kind of uh, ask some of the right questions. And the other thing it does, which I really like, is that it goes through and it gives you a set of questions that you can ask your actuaries. Um, I think one of the things that we don't do enough is give enough oversight to our actuaries and those that are accountable for our pension plans. Um, sometimes they put together these actual reports, and this, if you go to the page 53 of your book, um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but again, these are some of the issues that you really need to think hard about as you plan any sort of reform in pensions, or as you even deal with your pensions. This could be a good guide, not just for reform, but as you go before your committees in years uh, in the future, to use this as a guide to ask your, um, your pension boards, your managers, your budget analysts, are you, are you uh, addressing all these issues? And so I want you guys to use, uh, use this handbook, um, use it, abuse it. There's lots of great tools in here, and we'll go through a lot of that stuff today. Well, well you're on that, on actuarials. Good. Well, this will give you, again, a, a, a tool set that you can use for future committee hearings or meetings or anything you want to use uh, going forward. I think one note on actuaries. Um, actuaries are good at what they do. They, they crunch numbers. Um, they try to look in the future and give the best prediction as possible. But when they're employed by a system, they've got to think about their self-interest too. So as much as you would like to have them be independent, it's always good to be asking these questions and being independent coming and asking the right questions around it so they don't get stuck in a, in a rut. So we really have, there's all sorts of different kinds of uh, benefits and pension systems. We'll talk about four really quick. Defined benefit, um, which you're mostly in right now. Defined contribution, there's your hybrid types, and then your cash balance system, which is a defined benefit light uh, sort of system that's supposed to look like a defined contribution. Um, Adrian spoke about a lot of these things, but some of the reasons we have this pension crisis go back to um, a, a variety of factors. There was a report done not too long ago in at the was it Center for Retirement Research at uh, Boston College, I think, that had said basically any city that's having uh, bankruptcy or f uh, fiscal issues, <clears throat> it's not necessarily because of their pension problems, but the pension problems can be a piece of that. Excuse me, a piece of that pie. Mm -hmm. The one exception was California, where I'm from. So um, go figure. A lot of problems there. Let me move this stuff out of the way. So within this, there's sometimes the, uninten or the intentional underfunding, where you have systems that have not paid what they're supposed to pay. Um, every state has a different requirement for their funding strategy. Most uh, uh, are supposed to pay 100% to their, their system, to their normal costs. Um, but again, depending on what sort of returns you get, those normal costs may be sufficient or may not be. And if you've got to pay down debts, those are costs as well, and so those may be underfunded. Management, this gets back to some of your pension governance. Pension governance is very important. It's not something we're going to spend a lot of time on talking today, but your pension management and your pension governance should have people who are professionals who know numbers and investment strategies and finances. When we get pension boards that have too many people that uh, come from the pension system itself, you get a lot of fox guarding the hen house mentality, and that can be unfortunate. A lot of rosy scenarios rather than really good management. Uh, over generous benefits, <laughs> I don't know that Wyoming is necessarily a poster child for that. Um, in San Diego, there's a librarian paid $234,000 a year in retirement. Um, it's good work if you can get it. Uh, but in Wyoming, I'm sure you don't have that issue by and large. So. Mm -hmm. The average is a $44,000 a year for the firefighters. I mean, to me, coming from California, it sounds reasonable. I don't have any qualms with that. We want to make sure, though, that we can actually pay that $44,000 a year, right? Yeah. Adrian, just real quick. In a brief period of time with that 3% COLA, the firefighter will take the retired judges. Right. 
we have to put this all in perspective, right? So benefits have to be uh, meted out appropriately. And of course, a recession. I mean, it hit everybody. So that's, we, I don't think we should blame all our problems on that. Again, when you have good actuarial analysis, you have to anticipate that you're going to have your market ups and your market downs. And so you've just got to be willing and, and able to deal with that. We're going to talk about San Diego for a minute. It's a city, but as Adrian alluded to, there was a lot of problems there. And in fact, probably worse than a lot of other cities out there. They call it Enron by the Sea, actually, if you... Uh, <laughs> if you're if you're down there and for a while that was the moniker that stuck we just put out in fact a, a briefing report on San Diego and went to more details on this but really they're well below a, a decent funding strategy back in the early 2000s and because of a lot of really corrupt issues that were going in I mean it, it spanned the spectrum so this was not just pension fund issues but there were a lot of things that were going on but when you get to a place where you're 60 67 percent funded really you're in a world of hurt, and there's a lot of things that happen. Again, your costs and your benefits compound, and you can't catch up with that enough. So over a period of a decade, and I'm not going to go piece by piece, but they did little reforms. And so I know Wyoming has passed a few bills dealing with a, a couple issues, tweaked a couple last few years. Those are good things. Those are good steps in the right direction. Um, we're not a one-and-done sort of organization, so it's not one of these things where you have to come in and do it all at once. But the more you get done on the front end, the more money you save, so you're not worried about that on the back end. A um, couple things really quick, uh, dealing with the labor agreements, or retirement boards, that was a really important strategy. Again, that can be a, a strategy that is really effective at the beginning. Um, taxes are always that thing, right? If the pensions can't be paid out, what's the options? Cut services, um, you uh, increased your contributions, or you raise taxes. I mean, it's really your three options there. And so always the question is, what are you going to do about uh, funding? Here, it sounds like you've got a pretty decent severance tax um, base, which people will always have their eye on. When you have billions of dollars in there, that could be tempting to go after, but that doesn't solve your problem, right? So we've got to think about how do you fix the problem before you go on. Their biggest reforms in 2012, Proposition B, and they did it both in San Diego and San uh, Jose, concurrently, there are very similar reforms, a little bit different, but similar. And in San Diego, they switched all new employees except for police over to a uh, defined contribution. And when they did that, they restricted a lot of their um, uh, increases in pensionable pay, which is an issue we're going to talk a little bit about today, and um, wanted to make sure that some of the uh, felons that were in the system wouldn't get the money in the future. They had a lot of issues with elected officials and otherwise that were in prison receiving a pension. So hopefully it's not the case here in California, or in Wyoming, but in California, uh, we're up to five state centers in California that have been in prison this year. So, and all except for one are sitting still. So um, that's, uh, two, excuse me, two. So that's a problem. Yes? By the way, I just moved from California to Florida. Yeah, he left, he left the system. Like 52 years in California. I finally couldn't take it anymore. Okay, sure. Um, it is on. Uh, different levels of knowledge. Would you just real quick definition, define contribution, sure. define benefit? Uh, and in fact, I was going to go into that. So oh, let me, okay. Let me see if it's in here or not. Well, it's not in this section of slides. Define contribution is pretty simple. Uh, or define. Let's start with define benefit since that's where you are right now. Define benefit is. Uh, the government and the employees generally paying into a system where the benefit at the end, very end is guaranteed. And over a set of analyses and assumptions you have, hopefully that money you put into the system will pay that down. The thing with defined benefit, at least in the public sector, is the, the taxpayers are on the hook for covering all the costs that you don't make. Um, in the private sector for years, and this is something we wrote about back in 2005, the private sector had to cover those costs internally with, their, with any sort of gains they had. And they realized that uh, by and large, a, a defined benefit system was too expensive because it, you, they just weren't hitting those sorts of costs. And the normal costs are what you pay in on the front end per employee. Remember, pensions should be pre-funded. So it's not Social Security. Every employee you put into a defined benefit or to a pension system, that you're paying their full amount of what they should retire for when they're at the very end. Um, but private sector realized that they couldn't handle it anymore, so they, most of them have pulled out. Um, defined contribution is the, a little bit different, where you have 
you pay into your employees' costs, they pay in some to, to a 401k-like program or a TIA CREF or whatever, where they can go in and manage that. And that can be done in a whole spectrum of ways, but that benefit is not guaranteed. And once the, once the employer pays in, they're not on the hook or liable for any of those costs going forward. Did I miss anything, Adrian? Got it all, I think? No. OK. A hybrid system, as I kind of referenced earlier, is a combination of those two. We'll talk about that a little bit longer or a little bit later. And then the cash balance is a, is a defined uh, benefit plan with lower assumptions. It's a different way that they annuitize their money going forward. Some of the lessons we learned in San Diego are pretty important. One is you don't have to, again, you don't have to do all your forms at once. We're hoping that out of this conference, this summit, that we can engage each one of you legislators and put together a bill that can help you make whatever transition you want to make. And if that bill is significant and addresses all the issues, I think that's all the better. But if we get a nice piece of reform step by step, we're happy to help you out with that as well. So it doesn't have to happen all at once. That's what we learned in San Diego. Conflict of interest issues are always important. I would address those first if you can get to that. Want to make sure you have transparency and audits. People looking from the outside. Um, one of the things that we have done in any place that we're going to do reforms is we put together actual analyses that are in layman's terms. So you can actually read and understand what these numbers mean. Uh, we've done that in Tulsa. We've done that in Phoenix. And we've done that in Ventura County. And I think they're very accessible things. And if in Wyoming decides to go forward, that's a service we're willing to provide to you going forward. Um, Wyoming, again, if you can't get to the legislature, you know, the question is what sort of access do you have to the public um, in terms of reform or the ballot box? Um, and then also educating the public. And again, a lot of the misconceptions and myths about pension and pension reform are kind of the reason we have some of the protesters outside today. They don't understand that if you don't have money in the system, as Representative Burkhart said at the beginning, there's just no money there. You can't grow it on trees. So we've got to do something to protect the system going through. Part of that requires that you seek outside legal counsel sometimes. Again, those that are inside the system are going to be a little um, hesitant to reform something that they have a stake in. So it's always good to have the outside looking in. And then make sure that you get sort of good uh, political consulting along the way. These are the six steps that we um, have for doing successful reform. Making sure to research your problem. And this is also on this poster here. And it's throughout the handbook as well. So as you look through there, it's, it's all laid out. Uh, research your pension problem. We're going to talk about that in a second. Examine those options for reform, creating a reform coalition, making sure that you get the right people at the right place to do this reform, building that case and educating the voters, engaging elected leaders, which we're doing right now. We're taking a front step. And also labor unions as well. And there are ways that you can engage labor unions where they feel a part of the process, and Dan Lillinquist is going to talk a little bit about this and his success in doing that in Utah, and then taking your case public so you can sell it. Because the most important part is for you to sell this to the public. Once you sell it to the public, it's very popular, and, and it's possible to reform, as we've seen in all the other places it's been done. OK. Well, ask, uh, ask a lot of your parents who are tired of the kids being in classes that aren't fully funded. Or that, um, OK. So that, that's good to know, though. But what about your infrastructure costs and things like that? Are those all being dealt with appropriately? OK. Um, if you're not fully funding your pension system, at some point in time, you're going to have to pay down those debts. That's a lot of money. And unless you're willing to pull that out of these severance funds or other places, You've got to deal with those numbers sooner rather than later. Because remember, those costs compound. So if you don't deal with that now, your costs are going to get bigger and bigger as they go, ahead, go forward. Does that, I mean, am I off somewhere in well, Wyoming? I think, you know, I think we, we, finally, we finally got the legislature to begin to understand that. And that's why we had some pension reform over the last couple of years. Because they understood that the pension system was under threat. And that we know that, that we, we, we have to put the money in the system for the unfunded liabilities that currently exist. So, well, you know, we were talking about the, the firefighter pension system. How are you going to pay for that? Right. 
Well, you know, if we could get anything this, this session, if we could figure out how to get, get a consensus on Fire A, that would be, uh, that, that would be something I think that, that most of the folks here, I would hope, would, would consider that very successful. And the other problem that we have is we can't fund COLAs with this system, trying to figure out a, a separate way to fund COLAs if that's possible with the, with the uh, uh, employees being a partner in that. You know, those are, uh, those are the two issues that I see really facing us uh, as far as, you know, that, that are things that, that, that employees want and that are problems that are right there. We've got another one where we've got another small plan that's, that we're, we're spending 30% on the contributions or almost 30%. Don, yeah, there's a there's one problem with that one there. There's the you know I mean it's it's not all roses, but it's it's not as bad as California or Illinois. Well, and I don't want know. to compare them to those because that's completely yeah. unfair to you. But the yeah. question is, if you're not 100% funded, you have a problem. Oh, absolutely, and we we, we understand that, and and well, we'll we'll, we'll I'll, I'll I'll not interrupt your your deal anymore. No, it, this is most this is actually really meant to be an, an iterative process. The conversation has to happen with you. We're here to help kind of, you know, guide, direct some of the things we found have worked in other places, but it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. That's the other thing, too. There's models that you can go through, and every place is going to be distinctly different about how you address these issues. And so that's something as a legislative uh, body, as mayors of uh, different cities, city councilors, you've got to step back and say, okay, what does my state, city need so that we can make sure we're paying out all of our costs, our debt burden's not too high, and that uh, the taxpayers aren't soaked, and that the retirees get their benefits. I mean, really what it comes down to, you make a promise, you gotta keep the promise. And so, we're here to make sure that you can keep that promise, but you can't if it's underfunded. Adrian. Okay. Yeah, I just, building on that a little bit, I, I've, I've got to there, think. There's, there's two, a lot of places have done pension reform in the last five years around the country. And, and the ones that have actually you know, done more than sort of just little small tweaks have really focused on sort of two batches. One is, are there changes we can make to the existing plan to make it more sustainable and, and, and bring some balance or some sustainability to it? And then the second thing is, are there changes to the plan we can make to avoid getting out of whack in the future? So that tends to be creating these new plans for new employees. So they may be a defined contribution, they may be a hybrid uh, or something like that, but there's changes for new employees that are structured differently so that, and the, that it meets those three principles I was talking about while still trying to make some good changes to the existing system to keep it from becoming a financial liability or not having the money to pay out the benefits when people retire, which is kind of the worst case scenario you've seen in, in a few uh, bankrupt places. Um, so balancing those two sets of kinds of changes uh, plays out everywhere. The other dichotomy is the motivation. Again, there's places where they have a severe problem and you can go to the public and say, like they did in San Diego. They literally were not building fire stations. They had thousands of new homes being built in new developments with no fire stations or schools to serve them because they had no money to build them. And they said, you guys are going to have to keep shipping your kids and waiting 15 minutes for a fire truck unless we can get this budget under control. That's one scenario. The other scenario, which is more like what Wyoming is, is do we want to make changes now that will ensure the financial sustainability of this system going to the future. This is more like what Utah did. It was prophylactic. It was, oh, we've woken up thanks to the recession and seen the potential problem inherent in our current system. And what we want to do is make changes now that will ensure that future bad decisions can't get us in the same boat that Illinois, <laughs> New Jersey, and California. Because the only difference between you guys and California is that you haven't made the bad decisions as a legislature that those legislatures did. There's nothing inherent in your system that prevented it. It's just better legislators. And that sounds really bald, but that's exactly what it is. If you're sure that Wyoming will always have legislators just as good as they've had the last 10 years, you don't have to worry about it. 
If you worry that somebody might make a bad decision down the road and leave your grandkids with a big giant debt, you might want to build a system where that can't happen. And that's what they did in Utah and a few other places at, at the local level as well, where it's been, you know, Kern County in, uh, in California was one where they said, we're going to change it now so we never have a debt because we never want to pass a debt on to the next generation at the local government level. So. Same with Michigan. Uh, you'll read in, yeah. in on uh, page 19 of your handbook, it goes through what Michigan did back in the, the mid-90s. They looked forward and said, hey, we got a problem coming down the road, and they had really two major issues. They had your regular civil servant um, program, defined benefit. They froze that, and ref all the new employees went to a defined contribution system. But the teachers, they balked at finishing the teachers. They didn't do that. Fast forward almost 20 years. It's interesting to watch. The one they reformed, it's working, by and large. The one they did not, the teacher system is struggling, and they're looking at reforms now, actually. So you've really got to take and balance those issues out. We want to make sure that you're looking forward. Because right now, yeah, the problems may not look significant. But all it takes is one more economic downturn where you can't get close to even your 7 and 7.5%, 8 uh, expected returns where you have a problem. Uh, remember too, these returns compound. Um, if you don't get that 7.5%, it's only 7%. You, you didn't just lose a half percent that you're going to gain next year if you got 8%. You lost that, plus you lost whatever you thought you were going to get above that, plus you got to get beyond that the next year. And you have to consistently do that up. So even a small percentage change will um, impact you dramatically.